Hi there, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Kristen Muscati. I'm the um, Chief Medical Officer at NCH, and thank you for joining us for another one of our cardiac community Zoom meetings today. And, and I have the distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Hilary Tassin, who is a native of Southwest Florida, completed medical school, as well as her internal residency and a three-year cardiology fellowship all at the University of Florida. In addition to that, she completed a one-year advanced heart failure and transplant fellowship at the University of Florida, and she's board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, and adult echocardiography. So she's been practicing at Naples with us for the last four years, and when she's not working, she enjoys spending time with her two young sons. So thank you so much for joining us today. And as we talk to our cardiologists as well as the community, we asked, what would you like to hear about? And a number of the topics we've covered, we covered COVID and heart disease, again with Mayo Clinic, as well as looked at atrial fibrillation. And today's presentation is on um, congestive heart failure. So with that, I will welcome Dr. Tassin. We'll have um, time for questions at the end. And, right. and please welcome, good morning. Good morning, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'll be talking about heart failure today, and uh, we'll start just by explaining what heart failure is, and then we'll discuss the various causes, treatments, including medications, and some things we can do to help prevent developing heart failure as well. All right, so those, uh, we'll get started here. So I think most people have heard the term heart failure and are somewhat familiar with it, Many people have probably either known someone who's been affected by heart failure or maybe they've had it even themselves. Um, actually, as the population ages and as people are living longer lives and surviving other medical illnesses like cancer or having a heart attack and having a stent placed and living through that heart attack, whereas we didn't have those therapies in the past, people are actually living on and developing heart failure. Heart failure, uh, the incidence of heart failure actually increases with age. So um, that's, that's part of the reason we're seeing that more. And actually about 6 million people in the United States have heart failure wow. and over half a million are diagnosed each year. And actually at the age of 55, there's a 30% lifetime risk of developing heart failure. So this really does affect a large portion of our population. It's extremely common. There's over 1 million hospitalizations each year. And it's very expensive um, as a nation. We're spending $30 billion a year treating heart failure. So not only does it have a big medical and personal impact on patients, but also has big financial impacts. So there's been a lot of focus on, on treatment and rightly so. And interestingly, I don't think necessarily the general population always thinks of heart failure in these terms, but it can actually be quite lethal. Um, comparable to many cancers, and in some cases worse as far as the five-year death rate. Right. Of course, that depends on what type of heart failure. So that brings me to the next topic. Heart failure is really classified into two large groups, systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. Systolic heart failure is the type of heart failure that most people think of when they think of heart failure. And it's basically, uh, the way of thinking of it is it's a weakened heart muscle. You can see the heart in the middle of this slide, that's a normal heart shape. And the, the heart that has the systolic heart failure has a different shape. It has a rounded, more globular spherical shape. And the, the walls of the heart are actually thin. And that actually makes the heart muscle weaker and it makes it less hemodynamically effective. And so that's the most common type of heart failure. And that's the type that most people think of when they think of heart failure. But the other type is diastolic heart failure. Diastolic heart failure pertains to the heart filling with blood. Rather than pumping blood out, it's a problem with the heart filling. And you can think of it as the heart stiffening, basically. So when the heart is filling with blood, it takes a longer time to fill and, and not as much blood is able to fill. And that type of heart failure is associated with other medical illnesses and comorbidities like COPD, hypertension, and, and so forth. Um, so it's really two types. And, and you can actually have both types. Uh, most people that have systolic heart failure also have abnormal filling of blood, which is diastolic heart failure. 
So when someone has heart failure, they really severe case, they may, they may look like this. You can see in this cartoon, this man, you know, he appears to clearly be in a lot of distress. Um, and this kind of highlights some of the most common symptoms and some of the findings um, we'll notice when we're treating patients with heart failure. Probably the most common symptom is shortness of breath. Shortness of breath primarily with physical activity. Another very common symptom is shortness of breath while lying down. We call that orthopnea. So patients with heart failure commonly have to sit up at an angle to sleep at night. They have to use increasingly more pillows. Um, many of my patients will tell me they had to sleep in a recliner for a while. So that's, that's often a sign of heart failure. Also coughing, especially coughing while lying down is a sign of heart failure because the fluid in the lungs can actually irritate uh, the, the bronchus and, and cause coughing. And especially if someone is coughing up a, a pink frothy type material, that's usually pulmonary edema, that's fluid, that's very worrisome. Now patients can also have nausea and vomiting and abdominal bloating and distension. And, and those symptoms of heart failure are sometimes uh, lead to misdiagnosis. I've actually seen patients be diagnosed with a gallbladder problem. Mm -hmm. And then we find out later that it's actually from heart failure. So the fluid mm -hmm. can back up into the abdomen and cause a lot of, of gastrointestinal symptoms, but it's actually from the heart. So that's something that can be a little misleading at times. Now, swelling in the legs is another common symptom. And for men, they'll often have swelling in their scrotum um, and swelling in the abdomen. So those are some of the common uh, symptoms to monitor for. Um, in the late stages of heart failure, where it's more advanced, people can also have confusion because they're having a lack of blood flow even to the brain. And so um, they may be confused or sleeping frequently, sleeping all the time, just a lack of energy. Um, those kinds of things are what we really look for. So there are a lot of, lot of causes of heart failure. I'm going to try to highlight some of the most common causes, but there's really a long list, which I'll, I'll show you. Um, valvular heart disease is one of the most common causes. So that can be regurgitant valve disease, which is like a leaking heart valve, leaking mitral valve, for instance, or a narrowed heart valve. So having valvular heart disease is a risk factor for developing heart failure. Sure. Coronary artery disease is another very common cause. And so that's cholesterol buildup in the heart arteries. If someone has had a heart attack in the past, that can cause damage to the heart muscle that in some cases is permanent. And that can also lead to heart failure. Arrhythmias are also a common cause, particularly atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation often causes the heart rate to elevate. And if the heart rate is elevated for a sustained time period, that weakens the heart muscle. We call that tachycardia-induced heart failure. Alcohol abuse is also a common cause of heart failure. Um, fortunately, this can be reversed. If someone stops drinking alcohol, often it's not permanent, but it can cause fairly severe heart failure. Stress-induced cardiomyopathy is another type of uh, heart failure that we see Somewhat, it's not as common. And when we say stress, we don't really mean the stress that most people encounter on a daily basis from traffic or politics or whatnot. This would be a really stressful, catastrophic event that results in a surge of catecholamines. And the other term for it is takasubo. And takasubo is actually a Japanese term for octopus trap. And they called it that, it was diagnosed in Japan when there were tsunamis. And people, there's many fatalities related to the tsunamis and the survivors had such a release of catecholamines that they, many of them developed heart failure. Oh, um, and the patient's heart muscle actually had the shape of an octopus trap. That they, oh, so, okay. so it's kind of interesting, but we'll see this if someone um, witnesses a family member's traumatic death or you know something really stressful and traumatic, we'll see a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. The good news with this type of cardiomyopathy is actually um, it, it generally recovers. Mm -hmm. and, and cardiomyopathy is another term for reduced heart function or heart failure. So right. we're kind of using that interchangeably. And the catecholamines are those fight and flight fight or hormone, flight response. hormones that we get under that maybe intense stress or maybe prolonged even. Yes, yes, so an intense stress response. 
Myocarditis is another type of heart failure that's actually quite severe. Some people who develop myocarditis actually go on to need a heart transplant. And this can happen in even very young people. When I was at the University of Florida, we would see college students with myocarditis. This can be caused by viral illnesses. So um, the flu, the flu actually can cause myocarditis. And there are some cases of this being associated with COVID. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're seeing somewhat but we see it every year with the flu primarily, and there are other viral illnesses that can do that too. Now, there are types of genetically associated heart failure. So whenever someone's diagnosed with heart failure, we always wanna ask if there is a family history and if multiple family members have had a, a dilated systolic type of heart failure, that's very concerning for a genetic, a genetic link. Hypertension over a long period of time that's uncontrolled is, is also a potential cause of heart failure and um, a risk factor. So being treated for, for um, hypertension is a risk factor for heart failure. Infiltrative diseases are not as common, um, but we do see them. So there's a variety of different types. Amyloidosis is one, which is a protein, excessive protein deposition that can affect the heart and other organs. Hemochromatosis is another one where iron deposition can cause um, problems with the heart function. Sarcoidosis is another one. That's not a common cause of heart failure, but I, I have quite a few patients I follow with infiltrative disease, so we do see it. Now, this list I'm not going to read or go over, but it just gives you an idea of just how many different causes of heart failure there are. Um, some of the more rare things we do see is actually peripartum cardiomyopathy. So a young woman who has heart failure after, after pregnant, immediately during the postpartum phase, after she has a baby, can actually have a pretty severe type of heart failure. Thyroid disease can cause heart failure. So really, there's a pretty exhaustive you know, list. But I, I just wanted to highlight some of the more common causes. And, and so by infiltrative, those are more something that happens within the heart itself and heart muscle as opposed to some of the other things which yet can be toxic to the muscle, but some of them are on the outside of the heart, like hypertension and, and some of yes. those types of things. Yes, that's a good point. So now I want to move along to what kind of treatments are available for heart failure. And I'm going to start with this slide and don't worry, I'm not going to go through this in detail. That kind of is beyond the scope of this talk. But the point I want to make with this slide is that Heart failure does not just involve the heart. The uh, heart failure actually involves the entire body and involves the renin angiotensin system, which is a system that regulates fluid and, and salt management within the body. And that actually involves a very complex network of hormones that communicate between the lungs, the liver, the heart, even the brain, uh, arteries, adrenal glands, and many of the medications we use to treat heart failure are actually targeting the renin-angiotensin system and trying to combat the effects of the renin-angiotensin system. So one of the most common types of medications is an ACE inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And um, an ACE inhibitor actually inhibits this system, um, angiotensin 1 converting to angiotensin 2. So I'm not going to get too much into the details. I don't want to get bogged down with that necessarily at this point. but the medications we use target this system. And, and maybe a way that some of the medications, when patients notice sort of that fluid buildup that we had talked about before, that would be that edema in their legs. Yes. Right. And so they can sort of tell if things might not be going as well, if the, the legs seem to be changing, or like you said, that coughing at night. And that's all related to sort of that dysregulation or not proper functioning of that whole sort of fluid balance you're talking about. Absolutely, so, yes. So when the renin angiotensin system is, um, is provoked, basically it, cause reten it causes retention of fluid and salt. Mm -hmm. And it actually even makes you feel thirsty and it will make you drink more even, even though you don't need more fluid in your body. And um, so these medications will help combat some of that, yeah. So the first, the first treatment we use are diuretics. So these are water pills. These are pills that make you urinate. Um, these help alleviate that congestion. So the fluid can be in the lungs, it can be in the abdomen, it can be in the legs. And that's always the first step. We wanna get, get rid of the fluid and that's what really makes you feel better. Um, so the diuretics help the symptoms, but actually diuretics do not improve the lifespan of someone with heart failure and they don't, um, 
that they don't improve the lifespan, but they do improve symptoms. Now, all the other medications I'm going to talk about actually can lengthen your lifespan and prevent hospitalizations. So the next tier of medications are focusing on that renin angiotensin system. So there are ACE inhibitors. Um, you know if you've been prescribed an ACE inhibitor if the medication ends in ill. Yeah. So it's lisinopril, <laughs> enalapril, ramipril. These are very commonly used medications, not only for heart failure, but management of high blood pressure, uh, prevention of kidney disease in patients who have diabetes. So very widely utilized effective medications. Um, some patients will develop a cough with those medications. So an alternative is an angiotensin receptor blocker. That also affects that renin angiotensin sure. system. And then there's a somewhat newer medication called Entresto that many of you probably have seen commercials for. Um, it's, it's a very effective medication and it's an alternative to an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. And it's, it's really a successful medication as far as preventing heart failure, hospital admissions and extending, um, extending lives of patients with heart failure. The problems with Entresto are though that it is it's still pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. Insurance companies are not widely uh, covering it in some cases. So some of my patients unfortunately cannot afford it. And it also lowers the blood pressure considerably. And many patients with heart failure have a blood pressure that's too low. So sometimes we can't use that. And then some patients have kidney failure, abnormal kidney function. If they have abnormal kidney function, we can't use those first three medications and we can use hydralazines and nitrates. So these are just some, you know, if you're diagnosed with heart failure, these are some of the things that might be brought up. Then there's kind of a, a beta blockers. Beta blockers are the next medications that are commonly used and they slow the heart rate down and uh, basically allow the heart to not work as hard and that allows the heart function to recover. So the, the primary medications are beta blockers and then ACE inhibitors or Entresto. And then there are second classes of medications that are also utilized. One that is kind of the newest medication is a diabetes medication. Uh, many patients with diabetes also have heart disease or heart failure. And the most commonly used one is Jardius right now. And it's a medication for diabetics that also helps treat heart failure and prevent heart failure. Uh, it helps prevent heart attacks, strokes, and extends the life of patients with cardiovascular disease. So that's probably the newest, you know, most popular thing that we're adding. But the, that's considered more of a second tier medication. Um, digoxin is an older medication. We don't use it commonly now, but there are some cases where it's useful, you know, but it used to, before all these other medications were widely utilized, digoxin was one of the main medications used for heart failure treatment. So what can you do if you've been diagnosed with heart failure? What, what you know, what can you do to improve your situation? Well, the, the first thing is really to take the medications. As you can tell, the medications are selected very carefully and the doses are titrated up very, very cautiously and carefully and purposefully. And I think sometimes patients, um, and I, I can understand why, but they maybe get a little overwhelmed or frustrated thinking, you know, I'm on four medications for one, just my heart, you know, am I being over medicated? Is this too much medication? And the answer is no. The studies have shown that using this combined approach of, of, of these medications that I went over is the most effective treatment strategy. Mm -hmm. And each of these medications have a different way that they work, a different targeted spot that they're working on within that cascade of hormones. And we really have to use them in conjunction. So taking the medications is very important. I think that's such an important point because when we actually look at readmissions, when we look at patient understanding, even our patient satisfaction scores, one thing we struggle with is making sure, we, why do I understand why I am taking that medication? And if it has side effects or it seems like I don't completely understand why all the medications, it actually um, has a pretty big risk for reoccurrence and, and coming back in terms of readmission and one of the top reasons for readmission is not following your medications properly. So, so true. It's, it's so important. And one thing we see happening is sometimes people will initially have those symptoms of heart failure. They'd be very short of breath or tired. We get them on the right, right medications. Yeah. They start feeling better. And then they say, oh, well, I don't need those medications anymore, right? Exactly. Well, I can understand, I suppose, the reasoning there. But that's not at all what you want to do. You want to keep taking those medications 
because that's what has improved the heart function. If you stop taking the medications, you'll have heart failure again, which is the syndrome of the fluid accumulation. So it's very important to continue to take the medications, mm -hmm. even when your symptoms get better. That's, you know, I, I think that's so critical. Thank you for bringing that up. And these medications can get expensive, but you know, if, if the problem is a financial concern, always voice that to your doctor. There are um, drug assistance programs and there are often cheaper options. For instance, if someone can't afford a Tresto, I keep them on the ACE inhibitor and that's, that's a reasonable alternative, you know, so we'll work with you um, on that. Now, monitoring your weight is extremely important because if someone gains five pounds in a few days, it's not really possible to gain fat in that amount of time. So that indicates that it's likely fluid. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll gain the weight before you develop the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so it can be a very early signal that you're starting to retain fluid again. And if you're able to identify that quickly and treat it quickly, it actually can prevent a hospitalization. So that's a really important habit to get into for anyone who has heart failure. And typically, if we're noticing that someone has gained weight or is starting to have more shortness of breath, we'll have them take an extra water pill, and that tends to, to help quite a bit. Um, I would love, that is so important because again, it goes back to what do we see when people have to come back to the hospital? And in terms of the factors you can control, that really is a proactive piece mm -hmm. that is very, very important. So again, if you don't have a scale, if you don't have a way to monitor the fluids, um, let your physician know. And also, if you do notice that kind of fluid shift, we talked about how that's so important, a call to the nurse would be really helpful because you can proactively adjust things before you have the symptoms and end up going back to the hospital. So I, I think those top two points are so important. Yeah, and I think patients sometimes feel, uh, maybe when they're first diagnosed with heart failure, uh, overwhelmed or out, like they're not in control, you know, and there are things that you can do that are within your control that give you power over the disease, you know, and managing it and monitoring your weight is part of that as well as, um, diet. So that's my next point. The next point is you really want to avoid salt, salt, uh, eating salt makes, uh, makes you retain fluid and water. And that's especially true in patients who have abnormal heart function. And salt is everywhere in the American westernized diet. And, you know, patients can be misled by this because some people think, well, if it doesn't taste salty, it's not salty. And that's not true. Not, um, you know, not everything will taste salty that actually has a lot of salt content. And so you really have to train yourself to look at the nutritional labels because sometimes you'll be surprised. There are right, things that you would not think are salty and they're actually pretty salty. But foods to avoid in general are sauces. So dressings and ketchup and dips, um, you know, and often people will go to a restaurant and they'll get a salad and they'll think I'm being really healthy. I'm making a really good choice, but that dressing could really counteract those, that healthy choice. So you really have to watch that. Um, anything that's a preserved food is going to be salty because the salt is preserving it. So microwaved meals, canned foods, um, preserved meats, you know, salami, prosciutto, uh, cheeses tend to be salty, any type of finger food, olives are salty. So um, there's certain things you learn to just kind of avoid. Oh, deli meat is a big one. Um, so salt is a really, really big factor. And, and, you know, some patients will say to me, well, I don't add salt to my food. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. You're not adding, you know, salt to your food, but that's often not enough. Right. It, it really takes, you know, more vigilance than, than that. Um, also restricting fluid. And this is something that a lot of people are surprised by because I think our whole lives we're told drink water, flush out your kidneys, it's healthy to drink more water. And that's true, but when you develop heart failure, that's not that's no longer true. So you have to really restrict your fluid intake. Um, and that I think is a, that's a big change for some people. Um, and that includes any liquid, you know? So that's also like people have a tendency to not think about coffee right. as, as a, you know, but that's liquid. I'm one of those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe just because it's a habit, they've always yeah. done that their whole life. They don't even, they don't even consider it as, you know, I've got to include that. Or also soups, soups are fluid, you know, it's not a drink, but that has to be counted into your fluid intake. So, um, so initially when people are diagnosed with heart failure, we often give them the hospital, they're in the hospital, 
we'll give them a container that shows them what a leader is, you know, just so people can start getting used to counting, you know, how many uh, milliliters they're drinking. Alcohol restriction is really, really important. Um, anyone who has heart failure should ideally not drink any alcohol, um, at least keep it to an extreme minimum because that can exacerbate heart failure. So that's, that's the big one. And that's hard for some people that have had a habit of having a glass of wine every night, you know. Uh, tobacco cessation is also very important, just really for your general health as far as reducing cancer risk, but also um, tobacco causes cardiovascular disease, and including coronary artery disease, and then that in turn can cause um, heart failure, you know, so um, definitely no smoking and maintaining, maintaining a healthy weight is important. So this is something you can do preventatively. Um, to, to prevent heart failure from developing, obesity is a very big risk factor for, for especially diastolic heart failure, but really both types of heart failure. So that's an important thing to keep an eye on. Um, regular physical activity is also very important. That's, that's another um, factor within your control. Uh, regularly exercising um, will help prevent any vascular disease. So that's important. Now there are certain medications that can actually um, exacerbate heart failure by causing fluid retention. So um, steroids are a big one. A lot of patients receive steroid injections for different types of um, arthritis or back pain um, or, or are treated for ster with steroids for lung disease, COPD or asthma, and that tends to cause fluid retention. So it's something you have to be careful about. It's not to say patients with heart failure can't receive steroids, but we just have to really monitor for any fluid retention with that. Um, nasal decongestants tend to raise blood pressure, and that also can, in some cases, you know, uh, cause a heart failure exacerbation or problem. Um, and then non-steroidal anti-inflammatories also are, should be generally uh, avoided as well. So, so in summary, uh, treatments, um, the, the, first, the first step is to try to identify what medical condition contributed to or caused heart failure and then focus in on treating that, that's, if that's the main cause. The second um, therapy is medications, being compliant with medications, understanding why we're utilizing those medications. And, um, and typically once we get patients started on medications, we will kind of try to increase the doses over time. So just working with your doctor on that. The reason we do that is a lot of the heart failure research has shown that the higher doses of these medications actually improve outcomes long-term. So it's, it's not that we just start the medications on the first appointment and then you're done. It's a process of kind of titrating the doses and, and really trying to optimize things over time. Lifestyle modifications, so again, that includes reducing the salt, reducing the fluid, exercising, monitoring your weight, monitoring for recurrent symptoms. Cardiac rehabilitation is something uh, we, we do offer at NCH, and I refer most of my patients with systolic heart failure. We have a really great team that, um, that works with people on kind of gradually increasing their physical activity. Many people are kind of concerned about exercising when they've been admitted to the hospital for heart failure or if they've had a heart attack, they're kind of scared to get sure, back into it. Absolutely. And that's where I think cardiac rehab is really useful because you have someone there who's medically trained, they monitor your, your heart rate response to exercise, your blood pressure response, they look at your EKG, and, and they know how much uh, to push you and what's, what's medically safe, you know? So that's, that's a great um, resource, I think, as well. And then um, I didn't talk about this earlier, but when someone has a really weak heart muscle, we know that they're at risk of having a ventricular arrhythmia called ventricular tachycardia. And this can actually be fatal. And that's actually one of the most common ways someone with heart failure passes away. So when someone has initially been diagnosed with a weak heart muscle, we tend to have them wear a life vest. Mm -hmm. A life vest is a, is a, a vest that is monitoring your heart rhythm. And if you have a dangerous heart arrhythmia, it would actually deliver a shock that could be life-saving. And it's a temporary defibrillator to see, uh, to give us time to work on medications and see if the heart function will improve over time. It takes several months for the medications to make a big improvement. 
So typically we'll have patients wear a life vest for about three months and then we'll reassess the heart function. If it's improved, then the risk of having a ventricular arrhythmia is much lower and that's great news. If it hasn't improved, then we focus on putting in a permanent defibrillator, which, um, which would do the same, which would provide the same function. It would monitor for any type of arrhythmia and provide a shock that could be life-saving um, if someone had a ventricular arrhythmia. So that's another component of heart failure management. I think maybe an important point too here is, is when people think of someone having a heart attack, there's it actually could be heart failure with an arrhythmia arith that actually causes what we think might be a heart attack. And it's really a, what clinically in the hospital we call a heart attack is really that more narrowing of the arteries with the blood supply. But this is another acute event that can happen that needs EMS and that kind of thing. I think people think is a heart attack, but really it is congestive heart failure with the arrhythmia. That is an excellent point. So um, sudden cardiac death yes. is something that can occur where someone you know, passes away in their sleep or just passes out on the sidewalk and they die. So it's very, very quick. Something that happens that fast is very suspicious for a ventricular arrhythmia. And typically that is caused by heart failure. It can also be caused by a heart attack. So, you know, it's a little confusing, but um, but that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what we're really trying to prevent. Uh, one of the things we're trying to prevent by treating heart failure, and we're trying to improve the heart function such that the risk of a ventricular life-threatening arrhythmia is much lower. Absolutely. So now sometimes people continue to do poorly despite all of these interventions, all of these medications, these lifestyle changes, the defibrillator. You know, if patients are still you know, recurrently getting admitted to the hospital, not able to do much, very fatigued, then we have to think about what's called advanced heart failure therapies. And there are several. There are inotropes. Inotropes are very powerful medications that improve the heart's contractility and strength, but they're only provided intravenously. So it requires having um, what's called a PICC line, which is a line that goes through direct catheter that goes directly to the heart and it requires a pump that they have to wear, um, but it is something that can improve quality of life and prevent hospitalizations. And then um, another device that um, is some, sometimes utilized is a left ventricular assist device, which is basically what's pictured here on the slide. And it's a, it's a mechanical pump that diverts blood from the left ventricle up to the aorta. So it's basically bypassing the weak heart muscle, it's taking over for the heart muscle. And patients can actually, if someone's sick enough to need a left ventricular assist device, typically their expected, uh, their life expectancy is roughly six months, okay? And with the left ventricular assist device, people can live five years or more uh, potentially. So it really can add a lot of uh, quality time. Now it that's another talk in and of itself, there are a lot of problems with left ventricular assist devices too. And that's not something we would do here. That's something that requires a referral to a tertiary care facility. Um, but it is something that's offered for refractory or advanced heart failure. And then heart transplant is another option too. Um, there are age limits to heart transplants, usually around age 65 or 70 is when it's not really considered an option beyond that. Um, but for our younger patients, that's sometimes a, you know, a good option. And I work with a lot of, I, I did a heart transplant fellowship. Um, so I'm familiar with that. And I refer a lot to the tertiary care centers and work with them on heart transplants as well. So that's something, you know, we do have to consider in some of our patients. So, um, so our goals of care, when we think about treating heart failure, are first of all, to resolve the congestion. So that's the immediate treatment. When someone comes in, their lungs are full of fluid, they have fluid in their legs, we want to get the fluid out. Sometimes that takes a while, but that's what really makes people immediately feel better. Then we, in some patients who have really severe heart failure, they're not actually pushing blood to the rest of their body. So they may have cold legs, they may have kidney failure because their kidneys aren't getting enough blood. They may not be thinking clearly because their brain isn't getting enough blood. So we want to improve perfusion. We want to help the heart pump blood and get blood to the entire body. So that's always a focus. Now that's more so in the hospital when someone's really um, in severe heart failure. But long-term, 
one of the really main focuses of heart failure treatment is to improve functional capacity, meaning improve what you're able to do. So for some patients, that means they want to get back on the golf course. You know, some people, that means I want to play with my grandkids. You know, I always ask my patients, what is it that you're working to? Because it's different for different people. And it depends on the severity of the heart failure. But that's a really big focus is we want to improve what you're able to do. We want to get you back to your normal life and a good quality of life. So that's a big, big focus, especially in our community. Everyone is so active. I have a lot of patients that despite advanced age often, I have a lot of patients that are in the 90s that are playing tennis and right. you know, like really active. That's so impressive. yeah, it's great. So we have an active community. So that's always a really big focus. Um, then we really want to prevent hospitalizations. Nobody wants to be in the hospital and uh, you know, and so we want to keep you healthy and keep you out of the hospital as much as we can, but we're ready to take care of you if you are sick enough to need to go in the hospital. Um, but that's a way to improve quality of life. And also, Every time someone is hospitalized for heart failure, that's a very bad prognostic sign of how they're gonna do long-term. So that's another reason we wanna keep them out of the hospital and identify uh, symptoms quickly to try to prevent it from getting out of hand. And then we wanna prevent fatal arrhythmias. We kind of talked about that with the life vest, the defibrillators, the arrhythmias are very, potentially very dangerous. So that's something we're trying to uh, correct as well. And we want to extend your life. We want to extend the qual. We want to improve the quality of life, but also extend the quantity of life. Hopefully. So uh, those those are uh, that. That's the review. I think we can uh, take some questions now. No, I, I so appreciate that. I think something that maybe we're not all aware of. We hear about heart disease, but I, I don't think we really understand your first few slides of the public health impact that this has on our entire community. Yeah. And it is such a common heart disease that it's, it's something we definitely wanted to bring to people's attention and, and talk about as well as some of the symptoms. It's so very, extremely, extremely prevalent. It is. And yeah. what else we can do to take control of it. The other couple of things we, we've talked a little bit about, how do we stay out of the hospital and what can we control, which is so important for patients, talking about medications, monitoring weight, some very simple things, obviously eating healthy and all the other lists that we know we should be doing. I think another message that we've seen recently just related to the, the time we're in with the pandemic is we do see patients not coming to the hospital when they absolutely need to come to the hospital. And, and we've talked about this on most of our community Zooms that the hospital is safe. We've done an incredible job in terms of taking care of COVID and we have a hospital within a hospital model to make sure that patients are safe when they come to us. I, I will say even very recently when we talk to our physicians and our emergency room. Um, just last week, we were hearing we actually had a patient come in with a very severe heart attack, as well as another one with a very severe stroke. They walked in because they were afraid to use EMS. So I think we are continuing to see the fear of, of, of patients not coming to the hospital. And I do want to make sure, absolutely we want to keep you at home. How do we optimize that for you? But at the same time, if you need to see us, we are here in the clinics, we are also here in the hospital. And, and please use those services because with this change we've all gone through with the pandemic, we're actually seeing a shift in terms of fear for patients to come in. So I, I just wanted to quickly address that as well. But we would love to, yeah, we would yeah. love to open up for questions. Yep, and we have a few questions. And for our audience and anyone watching, please access the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen if you do have any questions. So the first question we have is, can heart failure be reversed? It can to some extent, yes. So um, particularly if someone has systolic heart failure, which is the weakening of the heart muscle, the, the medications that we utilize have been shown to increase the heart pumping function over time. And um, not everyone's heart function will, will normalize, not, you know, not everyone who has heart failure, but many patients that I see have had full recovery of their heart function just by taking the medications and making these lifestyle modifications. So yes, it is it is potentially reversible. Dr. Tassin, you mentioned foods you should avoid. Are there any foods you would recommend for someone who is suffering from heart failure? Well, I would just say in general, uh, a healthy, the things that we commonly know are, are a healthy diet. Um, so I would say lots of vegetables, fruits and vegetables. And um, because many patients with heart failure do have coronary artery disease, a low cholesterol diet is, is um, a good thing to adhere to. So that would be low in red meat, so avoidance of steak. Um, 
and burgers and cheeses, um, that, that can be beneficial, but primarily avoidance of, of salt. But I would say a, a diet that's rich in vegetables would be important. And it seems to come down to actually looking at the products on the back to see how much sodium, because I think when we actually add that up, it's unbelievable where salt is hidden. That's what I've learned yeah. when I've tried to help my family members. Especially eating out at restaurants. And I mean, Naples has, you know, we have some <laughs> of the best restaurants. I love going to them too, but you have to be so careful. It is hard to find a meal at a restaurant that's not high in salt. I mean, really, and especially like the bread they bring out beforehand and everything. You have to be really careful eating out. Yeah. So our next question, um, can someone have heart failure with having any physical signs of having it too? So are they, can they be aware of it without actually feeling the physical effects of heart failure? Well, technically the term heart failure really pertains to the syndrome of fluid retention and, and symptoms, mm -hmm. but patients can have reduced heart function before they develop symptoms. So yes, sometimes uh, the, main, the main way we recognize reduced heart function is an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart where they put some gel on the chest and take pictures. It's actually a very simple test, but it gives us so much information about the heart squeezing and pumping function, the heart valve function, lots of information. And, um, and yes, sometimes patients do have reduced heart function and they have not yet developed symptoms, but eventually someone will develop symptoms, you know, if they have it long enough. So the next question, does heart failure make a patient sleep more? So if I'm feeling sleepy, more sleepy, can that be a sign that things are worsening? Absolutely, yes. That's one of the most common symptoms is um, fatigue. And so yes, definitely. And, and also fatigue is sometimes caused by sleep apnea, which is um, a reduction in oxygen levels at night from obstruction of the airway. And sleep apnea is very much correlated with heart failure. Untreated sleep apnea is one of the risk factors for development of heart failure. So, some, so fatigue can be from sleep apnea, it can be from heart failure, and then it can be from many other things too. I mean, it's kind of a vague symptom, but yes, one of the most common symptoms of heart failure is fatigue. The next question, we've had a patient that's recently been diagnosed with heart failure. They used to be an avid jogger, but they've slowed down with jogging now. Is there any physical exercise you can suggest that would that's useful for them now that they've been diagnosed? Well, you know, as far as um, physical limitations, it's really dependent on each patient. Um, but what I tell people is try to just really listen to their body. Um, I think you can, I want patients to be physically active even when they have heart failure. Um, but if they become really short of breath or really fatigued or feel like they're gonna pass out, then they have to stop, you know? But um, I encourage people to try to gradually increase their physical activity. Usually that would start with a walking program, walking briskly um, and just working up uh, how quickly you walk and how long you walk over time. Many patients who have been diagnosed with heart failure, especially those who have been hospitalized, actually get deconditioned from being in bed and, and not being as active. And so sometimes some of the reduction in what they're able to do is simply from deconditioning. They just haven't been exercising and out nice. walking. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I think walking is a great exercise. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our patients have joint pain though and they have a hard time either with hips or knees walking. So swimming can be a really great activity. A lot of my patients do water aerobics. Um, there are a lot of places that offer water yeah, aerobics absolutely. in Naples, and that can be a great physical activity in Naples where it's you know hot all the time. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Completely agree. Well, sadly, due to time, we're gonna have to close the Q&A and wrap things up. Well, great. Well, thank you again for joining us. And thank you so much for all the great information. I think this was a great discussion and we all learned quite a bit. So thank you for joining us today. And then uh, just one other announcement. Our next event is on December 12th at noon. And that one is Healthy Heart for the Holidays. And that's a combination both of with Mayo Clinic as well as um, Dr. Sublet, one of our NCH cardiologists as well. So we look forward to joining you then. Hard to believe the holidays are already around the corner. Yeah. I have a feeling some of the slides we shared today will also be part of the how do we remain healthy um, during the holidays. But with that, we'll close. And thanks for joining us.